Uh, Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 25. Uh, Speaking on the subject of a community revived and all of that, uh, this is what we want to dive into today. Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. How many of you know it's going south from here? And tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and, watch this, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a Certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now, watch, here's, 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 here's his answer. He said, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. For a few minutes, I want to preach on this subject. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Father, in Jesus' name, help us. Thank you, Lord, for your felt presence here this morning. I pray that your word would go forth in power and in unction and in authority today and that you and you alone would receive glory and honor and praise in this place and that the hearts of the listeners would be challenged and convicted by your word today. And for all that you do, we'll be very careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, you may be seated today. The lawyer asked a question, trying to trip Jesus up, and said, if loving your neighbor as yourself, um, it would be singularly easy to just say, well, the people that live right beside of me, as long as I love them as myself, that is a pretty easy task at times. Um, But Jesus redefines the word neighbor here, and he gives the, 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 the parable here of, of, of three different men. One was a priest. One was a Levite. One was a Samaritan. There was a man that was caught among thieves that had robbed him and beat him and left him half dead. And out of these three men, two of them walked on by, passed on by, and one stopped, came to where he was, bound up his wounds, 
loved on him, took care of him, put him upon his uh, probably horse or beast or whatever he was traveling with and took him to a place of lodging, took care of him there. And when he had to leave and get to give him the time to heal, he left money at the end to take care of him and said, whatever he needs to heal up, when I come back, I'll pay you for the rest. And Jesus said, now you tell me, who was the neighbor to this man? And even the lawyer had to say, the one that showed mercy on him. I believe it is the will of God for every one of us as the children of God to operate in mercy. I'm going to say it again until our balcony wakes up and helps me and says amen right there. I believe it is the perfect will of God for the people of God to operate in mercy. I believe there is such a thing called the gift of mercy. Yeah. I believe some people have it. And I believe some people do not have the gift of mercy. If I have a pet peeve with spiritual gifts, it is that we embrace our spiritual gifts and we reject those that we don't have. That is not the way it is supposed to work. We have spiritual gifts, and we're to work on the areas that we don't have strength in. It doesn't mean I don't have the gift of mercy, so Josh gets to do that while I don't have to. Josh has more mercy than I have. We talk about it all the time. I'm mad, ready to cut somebody's head off. Oh, preacher, let's give them another chance. I said we done gave them 45 chances, Josh. But one, you know, yeah, you know it's right. <laughs> They call me the weed eater. If it gets to my death, I am not the most merciful person in the whole world. Some people have it. Some people do not. But it does not negate the fact that all of us should strive to operate with mercy. You know, we should operate with the same amount of mercy that we would want somebody to operate towards us. If you were down, if you were out, if you were hurting, if your marriage fell apart, if your kids went wayward, how much mercy would you want shown to you? I ain't even preaching, and I feel the Holy Ghost. How much mercy would you like to be dispatched towards you? Whatever level of mercy you would like dispatched towards you, God help us to have that much mercy to dispatch into the lives of others. I heard one song, If I'm guilty, let me be guilty of too much mercy. Did you know that it is not our job within the Word of God and in the realm of the Word of God to be the judge and the jury? No, God, God, God does not need your help concerning the wheels of judgment and all that He deals with. God needs you and I to be a merciful people and a loving people that has, and I'm preaching to myself today, all of us, that we operate in a spirit of mercy because there are people just like this certain man that was caught among thieves. There are people within our realm and in our communities every single week and every single day that need that same kind of mercy. And if we're guilty as a church, may we be guilty of too much mercy. I would say this, that people with the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy have a hard time living also with the spirit of mercy. You say, well, I don't know what I am. Then you haven't been through the new members class and you haven't took the spiritual gift assessment, which you should. You would learn, you would, you would already know what I'm talking about. You would know what gift you operate in. I have, I, I, operate, I have spiritual gifts of prophecy and, and, and administration. So mercy is way down on my list. Those that operate with the spirit of prophecy or the, or the spiritual gift of prophecy um, see things black and white. It's right and wrong. And if it's right, thumbs up. If it's wrong, cut your head off. Am I right? And all y'all are different. Oh, all of you are different. 
And I got some people that are merciful. And when stuff goes, oh, preacher, we're praying. And then somebody. <laughs> Listen, God was the preexistent one. He is the omniscient one. He is all powerful. And listen, here, this might be a news flash to a lot of us. He don't need your help. If we are the hands of Jesus, how much have you been helping lately? If you are the feet of Jesus, how much have you been going towards people lately? If you are the heart, all that we are in this day and hour, many of us are the best Bible anybody will ever read. And may they smell and read and acknowledge mercy flowing from our lives. I want to give you a couple things about this. And I'll take my seat. Uh, But I see a neighbor displayed. I see a neighbor displayed within our text. He said, who is the neighbor? And Jesus goes into this parable and speaks about a certain man that fell among thieves and Uh, They uh, stripped him of his garments. Not only did they strip him of his garments, but they uh, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. They stole everything that he had. And the Bible says, first of all, in verse number 31, and I I don't believe it's by accident, the, the, the characters that he chose here, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. Wouldn't you think he just said a drunk walked by and... The drunk didn't care nothing about him and he just walked on by. But no, no, no. The Bible said a priest. How many of y'all know that religion will leave you half dead? Yeah. I got half of you with me. I said, how many of you know that religion will leave you half dead? Religion's never saved anybody. Religion's never turned anybody's lives around. Being a Baptist doesn't make you any more saved than anybody else. Being being religious or going to church every single week, that that don't mean you're special in the eyes of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says the best of our good works are filthy rags before God. We are no more special than anybody else just because you come and sit on a pew on Sunday. Just because you learn how to tie a tie. You can wear a tie uh, that, that, that is sanctified you can have your dress clothes on you can have a dress all the way to your toes and have everything just right morally and ethically and done right and on the inside still be as corrupt and defiled as the worst person on the streets down there ladies and gentlemen we see religion walking on by and not meeting the needs of this man that was on the wayside We see number two, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, verse number 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, uh, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. There we see again, you could do a study on your own about the Levite. A Levite, was the, they were the tribe. They were the people that were charged to take care of the holiest of things inside the things of God. They were the ones that had to carry the Ark of the Covenant back in the Old Testament. And we find that even the Levite, came by, and when they seen him on the side of the road, went to the other. It doesn't say that they just walked on by. It said that they went out of their way, went to the other side, and walked by this wounded man. But we see, um, thirdly, that there was a Samaritan in verse number 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. I not only see a picture of a good Samaritan, but if you you look really careful, you'll see a picture of what Jesus did for you and I in verse number 33, 34, and 35. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came... Where, I, ain't got, I, I really want to preach this, but I ain't got time. Uh, but, 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 but came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him. He didn't go to the other side of the road. I'm trying, but man, I'm telling you, that's good. Right? And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. A picture of mercy looks like this. He had compassion on him. He went to him. 
He bound up his wounds, poured oil and wine, set him on his own beast. That means he could have been riding on his own beast, but he preferred that man above himself and put him on his own beast. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him there. Uh, he, he not only just did it, but uh, he paid his own bill and the bill of the man that he had never even met before. Operating in a spirit of mercy. Let me ask you a few questions today. Don't answer them out loud. Don't look around the room. Don't be religious and think, well, I hope so-and-so's hearing this. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. When's the last time you had compassion on somebody? When's the last time you went to someone else? When's the last time you physically or spiritually helped bind the wounds of a friend? When's the last time you poured oil and wine into someone's life? When's the last time you preferred somebody else enough that you sat them on your beast and you walked while they couldn't walk? When's the last time you brought someone to an inn and said, hey, let me help. And, I, and while they're there, I'm going to take care of you. Instead of saying, well, I'm not the doctor. That ain't my job. When's the last time you paid for somebody else's bill? A neighbor displayed number two we see a neighbor defined and man if we can pick up one word uh, he said jesus talked about these in these three he said uh he said in this verses he talked about the, the great samaritan he said uh, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves in verse number 36 verse number 37 and he said he that showed mercy on him then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. If there's one word that categorized the good Samaritan, it was the word mercy. All of us should operate in a spirit of mercy. But not all of us do. Preacher Brown used to tell a story that I, I, I thought was so funny. And uh, I was thinking about it this morning. Uh, there was a woman who went to the grocery store early one morning in the middle of the summer, middle of July, and she went and got all of her groceries and got all the uh, canned biscuits and got all of her orange juice, got all of her stuff, and just like a, a woman, she left the grocery store and drove by Cato or something like that and thought, I'm going to go in there and shop for some clothes for a little while, and then what was going to be a short period of time of shopping, she shopped for a little bit longer. All the ladies say amen right there. Shopped for a little bit longer, maybe went and got her nails did and got all pretty fied up and everything. And uh, she left the little strip mall beside the Walmart and went back to her car, got inside the car and shut the door. And when she slammed the door, a loud gunshot fired. In that moment, she began to panic. She grabbed her head and on the back of her head, she could feel what she thought was her brains coming out. She began to scream, oh, no, I've been shot. She rolled down the window and began to scream, somebody, please help. Somebody, please help. I've been shot. They said some unmerciful person come over there, half caring, and looked in the window and said, you crazy woman, you ain't been shot. The, the, the can of biscuits in your back seat exploded and shot you in the back of the head. I don't think that was probably the most merciful way to handle the poor lady who was struggling on that day. But all of us are to be merciful in our lives. We see the culture of neighborliness in this text. The culture is no boundary. If you study the good Samaritan who was a Samaritan and you study the man that left Jerusalem, was coming down from Jerusalem, he would have been a Jew. When the Samaritan woman was at the well in the book of John and Jesus comes up to her, she, she said that the, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. It was a culturally diverse thing where, hey, you all stay over here and we'll stay over here. We're not going to cross the tracks. Those are not our people. You're not our people. We deal with our people and you deal with your people. 
May I say that the gospel is not a racial gospel. May I say that the gospel is not an economic status gospel. May I say that the gospel is not a Baptist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal or Methodist gospel. It is a gospel of whosoever will shall call upon the name. And we see this culture thing going on here. And I want to ask you, when's the last time you ministered to someone that was not in your culture? When was the last time you showed love towards somebody that was not in your cultural walls? And I'm not just talking about racism. I'm not just talking about economical hierarchy. But, but you, you put it all in one big lump sum and all of it is sin. All of it is wrong. I am to love my neighbor as myself. And when someone comes around and when someone is in need, it is not my job to judge them. It is not my job to find out if they are culturally in my realm. It's my job to love them and to show mercy to them. We see the culture of being a neighbor. We see the circle of neighborliness. No proximity. Jesus here redefines the concept of what it means to be a neighbor. The lawyer wants him to say the person on your left and the person on your right. Those are your neighbors. Jesus was showing your neighbor is not just someone that you sleep beside of across the property lines every night. It is whoever you are around in your everyday life. You're to operate in a spirit of mercy. Not only the culture of this, the circle of this, but the cost of this. Uh, it is costly to operate in mercy. The man leaves two pence and says, whatever he needs to spend, whatever the cost is for him to get well, when I come back, make me a tab. When I come back, I'll pay every dime that is needed to fix this man's wounds. When's the last time you paid out of your pocket to help, to love, and to encourage somebody else? There are blessings that come Defined within the realm of the Word of God, there are blessings that come from being a merciful person. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Psalm 41, 1 through 3. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him under the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. It sounds to me like it would be good for all of us to operate in mercy. Because of the promises in your Bible that flow into the lives of a merciful person. The neighbor defined. Let me ask you a question as I move on. If we polled the people around you and said on a scale of 1 to 10, if we asked Bill Workman's wife, say amen, sis. How merciful a man because you can fool the people you don't live with. But you can't fool the people you live with. A scale of 1 to 10, how merciful a man is Brother Bill. I don't want y'all to ask Becky that question. I can't say that I have perfected the sermon I'm preaching today. That don't mean it's not true, though. How merciful a person am I? Why you say that? Could we be defined as a merciful person? I sure want to be. I sure want to claim the promise that uh, we find in, in, in the book of Psalm 41. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. How many of y'all want to stay alive? I do. Uh, and he shall be blessed upon the earth. How many of y'all want to be blessed upon the earth? I do. And thou wilt not deliver him of the will of his enemies. How many of y'all claim that one right there? Uh, the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. That will make all his bed in his sickness. 
Sounds to me like we need to be more merciful. The neighbor defined, and lastly, the neighbor, the neighbor's demand. Jesus said, which of these three would you say was the neighbor to that man? He said, the one that showed mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. He was not just talking to that man. He was talking to you. And he's talking to me. It don't matter. Look, I, I like, I like, look, I have preached in churches that don't say amen, that don't encourage the preacher. And I would way, way rather have y'all encourage me as I preach than be in a dead church where they don't encourage me while I preach. But, but hear me. Just because you can shout in church don't mean you're spiritual. Just because you can sing a good song don't mean you're spiritual. Let, lean in. Just because you can dissect a verse and you have great understanding of revelation within the Word, that doesn't mean you're a spiritual person. No. But I'll tell you what does lend itself unmistakably is a person that will get over themselves and lean down and help someone that cannot help you in return. And I made that distinction that last statement because there are people that maybe you help knowing that they can help you in return. But it is different when you help somebody that can do absolutely nothing to help you in return. Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Proverbs 19 and 17, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord and that which he giveth, given will he Pay him again. Hebrews 13 and 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You ever seen somebody fall spiritually? You ever seen somebody that was doing so great one moment? Maybe they were preaching. Maybe they were singing. Maybe they were doing great things for God. And then they fell in a sin or a fault. And the church, like a bunch of chickens, starts pecking. The Bible says in Galatians chapter number 6, 1 and 2, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here it is. Bear ye one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Y'all know something I love about this church is it's not a perfect church. It's not full of perfect people. If I sat here and told you the things that only I know, the things that have been done by the people that sit in these pews, you'd say, man, I ain't going to that church no more. Somebody said, did you hear? About that church and all the stuff that went in there. I said, you don't know the half of it. And let me say that. And likewise with every church in the whole world. Because there is no perfect church. Because there are no perfect people. And we all have flesh and we all have nasty and we all have a past and we all have a sin. But isn't it funny how the people that are covering their sin are always the one that want to attack the people whose sin has come out? The Bible says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, don't get on Facebook and talk about them. Uh, don't go to your friends and talk about them. You say, well, we're not gossiping, we're praying. No, you're gossiping. If a man be overtaken of all you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. That doesn't mean we pacify sin. It doesn't mean we justify sin. We deal with sin. We confront sin, not in anger, but in love. With the end goal to be restoring them, not removing them. The goal is restoration. Because we believe in a forgiving God. I know we ain't preaching much today, but we need this. 
The goal is restoration. I believe that the power of the Word of God and the power of the blood of Jesus, if there's an affair in the home, it's hard, it's difficult. But I believe the power of the Word of God and the blood of Jesus, that forgiveness can be granted. And working within the, the, the counseling and the help of a local New Testament church, I believe God can put back together what the devil tried to rip apart. Don't you? That doesn't make it easy. But I said it's possible. I believe a wayward teenager that runs out into the far country and lives their life and sows their wild oats while the church over the years has said, well, you stay out there. You got what you deserve. I believe instead the church ought to be having arms just like the father on the porch saying, come on home. Come on back. This is a place we have prayed for you every day since you left and operate in a spirit of mercy. And let me, let me say this. Don't be writing books about how to raise children when your kids are still little. I don't have much advice on child rearing. I tell Josh all the time, yours are older than mine. I'm waiting for you to get it all figured out and you tell me how to do it. Before you put your little opinion out on why so-and-so's kid left church or why their kid went off into sin, you better be very careful because those words could come home to roost at your place. You ain't better than nobody else. Only difference with most sin is they got caught and you haven't. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The neighbors demand, go and do thou likewise. I'll tell you this and I'll take my seat. It's 11.30 and we're done. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I don't know that that was very merciful, sir. <laughs> I've told this before, but it, it's perfect for this. Several years ago, when we lived in Anderson, South Carolina, there was a, a man that sat in the choir uh, every Sunday up there, just a joy of a man, just uh, always cheerful and happy. He didn't have a whole lot as far as this world would con was concerned. And um, he worked at a local grocery store as, as taking bags and bagging groceries and He's probably 35 years old, somewhere around there. And uh, it was Christmas time. We had just come out of the hunting season, and Tucker was much smaller. And I had begun to talk to my friends about buying Tucker his very first deer rifle that I specifically got for him. I started talking to my friends about caliber and scopes and the stock size and what would be perfect for a little boy to be able to hunt with wouldn't kick too hard and I made up my mind I was going to get him a, a Browning X-Bolt 243 uh, with the loophole scope you know us dads I think we really buy guns for ourselves in hopes but we say we're going to get them for our kids I don't know and I don't know what y'all do it but when I'm saving up for something like that uh, I'll, I got this little part of my wallet I'll, I'll start stashing money away all you ladies say amen because we know y'all do it too uh, start stashing money away, saving up for uh, whatever we're trying to buy. It was going to cost me about $750 to, to buy that gun for Tucker. And uh, I think I had saved about $500 of it up, and I was going to buy him that gun for Christmas, and that was going to be his big Christmas present that year. Um, somewhere around December 15th or 17th, we had a Christmas party, and I was running to the grocery store uh, to pick up some stuff for Becky and uh, I seen my buddy at the grocery store and he worked my booth I was at there and he got the cart and man we was talking about church and the Lord and uh, he's talking about all he had was his mom and how he, him and his mom was going to spend Christmas together and um, 
I'm walking out to my truck and we're loading the groceries and, and the Holy Ghost. Psst. Give him that money. You say, what'd you do? I did what you did. Thought I had indigestion and I, I, I heard wrong. Sure, surely the Lord, this is, this is for Tucker, Lord. Surely you're not asking me to give that money to him. But as sure as I'm standing here, I could not shake it. The Lord was laying it on my heart to give every bit of that money that I'd saved to that man, however he wanted to spend it, so him and his mama could have a good Christmas together. I would love to tell you that I was a really good Christian, but I fought it and fought it. And he started walking away with that cart, and the Holy Ghost said, what you going to do? And I hollered his name. I said, hey. He said, yeah, preacher. I said, the Holy Ghost won't leave me alone. I don't know what you need or why you'd need it. But the Holy Ghost told me to give you this money. I hope you and your mama have a great Christmas. And know that you're loved. Me and Becky care about y'all. And we hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I wish I could tell you that I was some super spiritual person. And maybe I was planting a seed and hoping that God would. No, it wasn't like that. I was obedient to what God told me to do. And I forgot about it. I went on my life Christmas morning. Tucker didn't get no gun. And I didn't even think about it. The very first week of January for years, I preached a, a New Year revival at Countryside Baptist in Guyton, Georgia, right outside of Savannah. It's Tuesday night of that revival. I am at the table signing Bibles and talking to people and Becky, we're, people getting CDs and all that kind of stuff and uh, a man stands off the side and is waiting for the crowd to go away. He was a country-looking man, and uh, his face looked very worried. He said, when everybody walked away, he said, Preacher, I hate to bother you. He said, but would it be possible for you to walk out to my truck and let me talk to you? I thought, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to go out to this guy's truck. He has heard me preach against something, and he's mad at me about it. He's just going to take me out. I started, I didn't have no security at that time. I didn't, you know, I didn't have, uh, how, what in the world, how, what are we going to do here? One of the assistant pastors, I, he said, he's a good guy. So I, still a little nervous, I walked out to his truck with him. And in the back of the truck, all I could see was gun cases in the back. And I thought, Lord Jesus. About the time I was worried, I remember him turning around to me and big old tears running down his cheeks. He said, Pastor, I've never done anything like this in my entire life. He said, I'm not sure why I'm doing it now. He said, all I know to tell you for the last two nights, I haven't been able to sleep. And all I can think about is that I'm supposed to give you these two guns in the back of the truck. Don't clap yet. It ain't time. I thought, man, you ain't got to give me no guns. I said, what? What? He said, preacher, don't argue with me. I got to be obedient to the Lord and do what he's told me to do. He pulls out. He said, I thought, I heard you talk about you and your boy hunting. I thought I would get you and your son Rifles, so y'all can go hunt together. So I got, he said, he said I bought these guns in December, and I didn't really need them, and I don't really know why I bought them, but I bought them, put scopes on them, sighted them both in, and got them ready. He said, I felt the last two nights that I'm supposed to give them to you, so you and your boy can deer hunt together. He pulls one out, that was a Tika T3, caliber 243, which at first I thought, man, a two, that was what I was going to get Tucker. And I was excited about that gun, but he showed me that one. I looked, I said, man, that's a beautiful gun. He said, well, that one's nice, but I wanted Tucker to have this next one, if that's okay with you. He pulled that gun out of the sleeve. It was a Browning X-Bolt 243 with a loophole scope on the top of it. He said, I bought it in December. 
and I haven't even hunted with it. I shot it, got it scoped in. He said, all I can think of is maybe the Lord bought it, had me buy it to give it to Tucker. And I don't know why the Lord's told me to give it to you, but I'm just going to be obedient. I wanted to give you. He had no clue, and I started crying. And I'm going to cry right now. (laughs) That nobody could have known the details of what I was going to do for my son. Nobody could have known the details of what I was going to buy for my son. Only the Holy Ghost knew. And in December, he was testing me to see if I'd be obedient. And if we want to get really down to it, I couldn't have bought that gun for $500. But I gave the little bit of money I had to that man, and then God flat out gave me not one gun, two guns and one of them was exact details who can do that but God let's let's be honest here if I hadn't have been obedient in December I would have never known the blessing in January and that ain't name it claim it that ain't prosperity gospel That is, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I want to call our church back to this statement. You're blessed to be a blessing. It's more than your bubble. It's more than just coming and sitting on a pew every single Sunday. We're going to know how spiritual you are, not not based on how well you sing or how well you shout or how faithful you attend church. When we do these things within our community, we're going to see who gets involved and who doesn't. My prayer is with these things that we're trying to put in place is that our church would rally and say, we don't want to just be in the church. We want to be merciful outside of the church. We may not win the whole town to Christ, but we want the whole town to know we're here. And when things fall apart, they'll know there's a preacher in that town that loves them and a church in that town that loves them and that there's a pew that they can sit in and hear the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, help me praise the Lord for the opportunity to operate in mercy.